Okay, welcome to our session on big team science. I'm excited to be uh, chairing this session because this is a very um, important and rapidly growing innovation in uh, multiple fields. Uh, there's always been, or for a long time, there's been very large collaborations in, in, in some fields, uh, such as uh, experimental high energy physics, genetics, um, and I think health and medicine. But I think the way it's being done in some fields, such as psychology, is a little bit different. And so it is somewhat of a new phenomenon. And we have th uh, four speakers today, um, and all of which are pioneers in this area, I believe, including our first speaker, Nicholas Coles, who is a research scientist at Stanford University. He's co-director of the Stanford Big Team Science Lab and the director of the Psychological Science Accelerator. He conducts research in effect affective science, cross-cultural psychology, and meta-science. And in meta-science, he works on building research infrastructure that allows researchers to more efficiently attain, obtain knowledge in the social sciences. And uh, we have Nicholas here on Zoom. So why don't you try to take it away, Nicholas, and share your screen. Great. Yes. Let me, it's going to, it always takes a moment to get the screen sharing to work. So bear with me. Let's see. Okay, Alex, can you just confirm that? Yeah, I confirm it's, that. Uh, um, see your slide. If that's what you're going to ask, sorry. Do you still see, do you see my presenter slide or you just see the presentation still? I see uh, this big slide that says grappling with generalizability constraints. That's all I see is one single slide. And okay, you don't see my notes where I profess my love for, yeah. for Alex Holcomb. Okay, yeah, perfect, I'll perfect. Okay. But I do encourage you to show this. <laughs> I'll share that offline then. Um, perfect, okay, then I can get started. Uh, yeah, super happy to be here. So thank you for um, the invitation. Um, before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone um, who's attending this session to take a moment and think about some of their big questions. And I ask you to think about this because I imagine that there were some pretty big questions um, perhaps ones that didn't involve no hypothesis testing that initially inspired you to become a scientist. And I always wonder if you were actually given one task in life to get an authoritative answer to your big question, what would it take? Um, how many studies would you have to run? How many different designs would you have to examine? How many different skills would you have to master? And when I reflected upon this question many years ago, I realized that it would take a lot. And this felt demoralizing because science tends to be a pretty constrained and lonely pursuit. It seems that our labs are too small and our funding is too limited and that some of the data we need to answer our big questions are really difficult to collect. So I wondered how could we ever hope to tackle the big questions when our scientific endeavors are often forced to be so small? Now I realized a few years ago, um, and as Alex recently alluded to, that there was a common answer that had emerged in many other disciplines over the past few decades. And that was to work together and do big team science. So that's what Alex is referring to when he talks about mapping the human genome and creating high energy particle accelerators and even estimating the reproducibility of entire disciplines. In my view, those are really big questions and their answers were only revealed to us through big team science. So my colleagues and I started adopting that model in psychology. And today I'll talk about how uh, some of my colleagues have done that, particularly within the Psychological Science Accelerator, in order to generate more robust insights about human psychology. So I'd like to take a moment and tell you all about the Psychological Science Accelerator. If you haven't heard of us, we're a network of over 1,300 researchers from 80 countries. In fact, we're actually approaching 2,500 researchers who voluntarily pool our intellectual and material resources so that we can complete large democratically selected studies in social and cognitive psychology. And we have a variety of goals in this kind of work, but today I'm going to focus on just one, which is improving generalizability. 
So if you think about a theory that might provide an answer to your big question, you didn't ask yourself, how would I test it? In psychology, I feel like we often start, for better or for worse, by deriving some sort of hypothesis. We then design a test of that hypothesis. We run our study in a very specific location. We analyze the data in a manner that makes sense to us. And then we publish our results, assuming, of course, that we have learned something interesting and important about the world. Now, this is the standard approach in psychology, but I think that we've recently found that this is leaving us with a pretty narrow view of the world. Because in actuality, we realize that there are many predictions that we could have derived from our verbal theories. And that for each one of those predictions, there's several studies that we could have designed. And for each one of those studies, there's several different areas of the world we could have run it in. And for each one of those executions, there are many ways that we could have analyzed our data. And these possibilities are multiplicative. And if you think about it, if there were only five reasonable ways that we could have done each one of these steps, there would be 625 different observations that we could have made. Yet the average research project usually only permits us to make a handful of these observations. And this raises a question about how generalizable that knowledge is, because it's difficult to know how things would have turned out if we would have run those studies differently. And some people have referred to this as a generalizability crisis, but I've always felt that where there are crises, there are also opportunities for growth. And the Psychological Science Accelerator and the broader movement of big team science attempts to accelerate that growth by pooling resources in order to increase the generalizability of psychology. And in the Psychological Science Accelerator, we've used this approach in about a dozen projects. And today I'm just gonna focus on two um, so that I don't ramble on for too long. So I'm gonna tell you first about the first ever study we ran. In social psychology, it's widely accepted that people quickly and involuntarily form impressions of others based on facial appearances. But we wanted to know, how is it that people do that? That was our big question. And according to a popular theoretical model, people make these judgments based on evaluations of trustworthiness and evaluations of dominance. So according to this theory, the moment that you see my face on Zoom, you make an evaluation of how trustworthy and how dominant I am. All the other attributes that you may assign to me, such as whether I'm humorous or awkward or passive, are theorized to be combinations of these simpler judgments of trustworthiness and dominance. But like many psychological theories, this is something that's been assumed to be universal, but has been largely tested and validated using Western participant samples. So in our first study, we wanted to examine the cross-cultural generalizability of this model through a global replication. So we started with the same theory-derived prediction. We then used the same design used in the original study, which meant that people basically viewed a variety of faces and rated them on traits like attractiveness, aggressiveness, and intelligence. And then we would later take those ratings and perform factor analysis to see if it could be explained by valence and dominance ratings. We then ran a study on approximately 12,000 participants from 41 countries, which for today will just collapse into 11 different world regions. We analyzed the data in two major ways and then formed an overall conclusion. So we started by using the same principal component analysis strategy used in some of the original research. And when we did that, we found that the theoretical model actually generalized pretty well across the 11 world regions. There were some exceptions, so it wasn't perfectly generalizable, generalizable in Eastern Europe, uh, but overall, this is pretty impressive. We then turned our attention to an alternative data analysis strategy that many of our collaborators felt improved upon some of the limitations of the other approach. So we used exploratory factor analysis. And when we did so, we found that the model didn't replicate very well across world regions. It was suggesting that the underlying structure of social judgments of attractiveness and humorousness and awkwardness actually varied across world regions, and that the fundamental basis of making these social judgments was different across cultures. 
Now, of course, this work has implications for understanding of social judgments across cultures, but it also highlights how issues with generalizability can be multiplicative. Because if we limited ourselves to just one analysis strategy, things generalized quite well across world regions. But when we took a look at a different strategy, they didn't. And I'd like to emphasize that this can apply to any branch of the research pipeline. You can, for example, imagine that certain study designs are highly replicable across world regions, whereas other study designs are not. You can imagine that some of the processes that we study may be relatively stable across different study designs in different world regions, whereas others may not. And this is the kind of thing that can lead to decades of debate in science. But our hope is that we can accelerate the pace of this discussion by running massive studies and combining our efforts in big team science. So because of time constraints, I can only talk about one more project. So I wanted to talk about one that's a bit of a pet project for me, and that's the Mini Smiles Collaboration. The Mini Smiles Collaboration is a global adversarial team of researchers who came together in an attempt to conduct foundational tests of facial feedback theory. So facial feedback theory, if you're not aware, refers to the simple idea that sensory motor feedback from facial expressions of, of emotion can impact our subjective conscious experience of emotion. But more simply, it suggests that smiling can make us feel happy and frowning can make us feel fad, uh, sad because the facial expressions are giving us feedback that's informing our emotional experience. When we started this project a few years ago, though, researchers were fiercely debating whether facial feedback effects were valid in the first place. And this was due to a large scale, uh, a large scale failure to replicate a very seminal pen and mouth smiling and happiness study. So to move the conversation forward after that large failure to replicate, we formed the Mini Smiles Collaboration. We brought together a large group of facial feedback proponents, facial feedback skeptics, and agnostics with three goals. First, we wanted them to articulate their theoretical perspectives regarding when facial feedback effects, if real, should most reliably emerge. Second, they were tasked with developing an experiment that would not only test their perspectives, but also help resolve disagreement amongst themselves. And then of course, last, we wanted to execute an international multi-lab experiment. So we began the collaboration with a pretty simple question. Does posing happy expressions cause people to feel happier? And one of the first notable findings was that if you ask a simple question to a large adversarial team of researchers, you're actually probably not going to get a very simple answer. And that probably tells us something about how complex our questions about the world are. And our collaborators disagreed about three main things. First, they disagreed about whether the facial pose has to resemble a natural expression of happiness. They also disagreed about whether facial poses could initiate feelings of happiness in otherwise neutral contexts or only amplify ongoing feelings of happiness. This is like the difference of smiling while looking at pictures of puppies and feeling happier versus smiling while staring at a blank wall and suddenly feeling happy. And last, they disagreed about whether facial feedback effect might be driven by demand characteristics or placebo effects. So we designed a test that would try to address all these questions. To test whether posing happy expressions cause people to feel happier, we had participants pose both happy and neutral facial expressions. To test whether they could initiate versus merely amplify ongoing feelings of happiness, we manipulated whether participants viewed happy photos while completing the facial feedback task. So if facial feedback can only amplify feelings of happiness, we should only expect to see an effect when these positive photos are present. To create more natural expressions of happiness, some participants mimicked photos of actors who were displaying highly realistic expressions of happiness. For less natural expressions of happiness, some participants were simply asked to move their lips towards their ears, which creates a partial smile. And then we decided to try to compare our results to the recent failures to replicate and included that controversial pen and mouth task. We then had the 26 labs collect data from 3,900 participants spanning 19 countries, and these are what the results told us. The results are graphed in a way that roughly mimics this experimental design matrix. So we have self-reported happiness on the y-axis, facial expression pose on the x-axis, separate columns 
for the facial feedback tasks and separate rows for whether positive images were present. So I'll first focus on the effects of smiling and the facial mimicry task when there are positive stimuli present. And this is telling us whether a high quality happiness pose can amplify ongoing feelings of happiness. And we found that it could. Participants reported significantly higher levels of happiness after posing happy versus neutral expressions. We next looked at whether this task could initiate feelings of happiness in otherwise neutral contexts, And we found that it could. We found the same pattern of results in the task where participants posed relatively low quality partial expressions of happiness. Last though, there was that replication of the controversial pen and mouth task. And contrary to the expectations of many collaborators, we didn't find much evidence of facial feedback effects in this condition. That being said, it actually did depend on the way we analyze the data. Some of the exploratory analyses did yield evidence of a facial feedback effect in this condition. So you have to read the paper to see whether you find that evidence compelling. But I will make it very clear that the pre-registered analyses that both proponents and skeptics agreed to did not yield uh, much evidence of a facial feedback effect in this condition, and that Bayesian analyses were actually far more consistent with the null hypothesis. Now, once again, what's most important is the collaborative structure. We had multiple designs, multiple study sites, different analysis procedures, and extremely nuanced conclusions. And by the end of the project, it felt like we had made nearly a decade of progress in just a few years. So I share these two studies because one way that we can learn how to use this new tool of big team science is to trade information about how others are using it. And we found so far that this is a very powerful tool that allows us to design more informative and complex experiments, collect data for those complex experiments, and explore complexity in data processing and analysis. And I believe this is only the beginning. So to wrap things up, I suspect that if you're listening to this talk, you still have some of your own big questions that you hope to one day answer. And my proposal is that we explore those questions together. My proposal is that we continue to build up big team science. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to um, chatting with you all and listening to some of the other presentations. Thanks, Nick, for that talk. And I think we've ended up with these uh, sessions, referring questions uh, to the end after the rest of the speakers. So if you can stick around. Absolutely, yeah. We'll come back, I guess. <laughs> that we, we would, some of us would appreciate that. So our next speaker is Julia Espinosa. She is a National Science Foundation postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard University. And her current work looks at the individual differences contributing to phenotypes, behavior phenotypes in domestic dogs, including life history, genetics, and neuroanatomy. Julia is a co-founder of the Many Dogs Big Team Science Collaboration and the project lead of their first study, Many Dogs One, a multi-lab replication study of dogs pointing comprehension. So are you able to share your screen? I believe so. Let me try right now. Here we go. Are you seeing my title slide? Or are you seeing any presenter notes? Yeah, I see no notes and just the title slide. That's great. Wonderful. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia. Um, as uh, I was very nicely introduced, I'm the co-founder of Men and Dogs, um, which is a big team science initiative studying the most phenotypically diverse species of mammal on the planet, our dogs. Um, so you might be wondering why would we study dogs generally since they're so common and available um, and why would they be the subject of a big team science project? Um, I mean, yes, they're absolutely fascinating and adorable, but moreover, the reason that they're truly interesting and unique is that they're the only mammal that's been functionally bred to live and work alongside humans, literally sharing our homes. And this gives us a window to, into understanding how selection pressures can shape cognition and behavior in non-humans in a way that really isn't possible with any other animal. So dogs are very common, yes, and that can lead us to think that we know a lot about them. Um, they're 
basically present in every part of the world where you find humans. Um, but this provides a fantastic opportunity for us to test various nature and nurture hypotheses because of the intense selection um, that humans have applied to define our different breeds that we're familiar with today, we can look at the heritability of particular characteristics that are relevant to hunting or herding or companionship, while also comparing the ontological vectors that play roles across the individuals themselves and work within larger populations. But one of the biggest challenges that we're facing as a field in canine science is identifying what are the causes of the individual behavioral variation in dogs. So what are the reasons that different dogs are doing different things? Is it because of you know, nature, like breed, or is it because of nurture, where they grow up and how they're trained? Um, obviously, it's got to be some interaction between these two, um, but this is really actually incredibly difficult to address with behavioral work because gathering data from a sample that is large enough to adequately test these questions would take literal years. Um, and even then findings would be embedded in the specific pet culture or the dog culture in which the data was collected, um, which doesn't help us generalize across the species. So um, some of the things that we think are the biggest sources of variability that we're hoping to address with our big team science collaboration um, are differences related to education and socialization of dogs, um, things that are heritable or the natural development over the lifespan, what job the dog has in society as a house pet or service animal and how that shapes behavior, and the broader dog owning culture in which dogs are living, uh, because that dictates how they're able to interact with the world and what places they're able to access. So finding concrete le links between these factors and how behavior um, uh, and, and the dog behavior that we're seeing requires absolutely enormous data sets and so, so many resources, which is why very few behavioral studies that are carried out in single labs include more than approximately 60 dogs. Some, some studies do, they do indeed, but it's not frequent and it takes a huge amount of time invested um, for many of the reasons that Nicholas already talked about. Um, this is better together and therefore many dogs um, to come overcome a lot of these the constraints we um, banded together in an international consortium based in canine science. Um, and we've just passed our fourth anniversary. Um, and despite the challenges of doing research and connecting with one another during a global pandemic, we've managed to steadily keep growing and moving forward. And uh, uh, we've made some progress on our theoretical and empirical projects that I'm happy to share with you in the coming slides. Um, it's been a tough four years, no lie. Um, like many researchers back in 2020, we had just, we had really bright hopes. So we had just come out of a very successful protocol pilot for our first study. And then the pandemic shut down all of our research sites um, because all of our dogs were not able to come in and participate in testing. But we put that time to good use. We published a pre-registered report uh, for our first study um, in the open access journal, uh, Animal Behavior and Cognition. And uh, we were able to start, to start collecting data finally in the fall of 2021. Um, so now we're nearing the end of data collection for our first study. We have 65 scientists who have been um, helping out. They're at all different career stages from undergraduate to tenured professors. Um, and they are grouped into 20 teams that are around the world. Um, and collectively we've gathered data from over 500 dogs and representing 80 distinct breeds but also a third of these are mixed breed dogs. Um, so our teams are quite diverse. Uh, the, they speak seven different languages and are spread ac across three different continents. Um, and we have brought together truly really a diverse and geographically distant group in this common goal. And it could not be more exciting to see us getting to this point. Um, if you want to keep up with the project, uh, you can find us on social media. We'll be tooting and tweeting as we continue passing milestones on this project and hopefully initiating others soon. I want to switch goals. Uh, sorry. Um, so, <clears throat> so where did this idea come from um, to do multi-lab studies with dogs? As Nicholas mentioned, like 
We all saw the replica replicability crisis emerge um, for psychology. Um, and so many of us had the same reaction like, oh dear, what does this mean from the work that I do in my field? This could absolutely be a problems that we will face. Um, so uh, it took a few years of talking and thinking about this, but uh, with the help of my extremely supportive supervisor at the University of Toronto, um, we got things going in a small group discussion. Um, and here you can see the, the first group that had our action-oriented discussion of many dogs um, and how to build, uh, uh, promote open science and replicability in canine science through a multi-lab project specifically. We kept talking and workshopping these ideas, and over the coming months, we developed, uh, we crystallized our mission into these four main goals, which was to enhance replicability in canine science specifically, uh, provide a platform for studies that would purposefully um, recruit and gather data from large and diverse samples, uh, quantify the sources of individual behavioral variability, whether that's due to breed or training or other contextual factors, and also, very importantly, to foster international collaboration on a global scale um, and unite our geographically distant people into a common network. Um, as Nicholas also said, science can often be really lonely and we need to do this together. So, uh, Following up on that theoretical mission uh, evolution, we um, de democratically determined that our first study that we would look at would be on a question that has been of great interest over decades of dog research. And when I say decades, I mean from the 90s, it's still a new field, uh, which is how do dogs interpret and respond to human pointing gestures? Are they considered to be socially informative or more like commands or imperatives? And also, could it just be that they've learned to associate our limbs with food and thus respond to them? But uh, we set out to address this with uh, this question by designing two contrasting pointing conditions to, um, uh, that would be done uh, within subject. One pointing condition was highly salient with ostensive cues like a high-pitched voice and direct eye contact. Um, and the other was an unobtrusive pointing gesture that did not include any direct eye contact or dog directed direct speech. Um, so by contrasting these two and noting down the differences of their responses to these uh, different pointing styles, hopefully we can understand a little bit more about how dogs view our, our gestures. So we are getting close to the end of data collection, um, and I'm hoping that we'll have some preliminary results to share with you soon and publish our paper. Um, we're going to be extremely excited to reach that point. It's a big moment to get that first project off of the, the conveyor belt. Um, but uh, also very importantly, I'm really excited to keep growing this project and having additional studies come in um, that people can work on that reflect the diverse interests of the canine science community. So changing gears a tiny bit, um, I wanna talk about my experience leading this group. Um, it was extremely uh, wonderful. I'm super grateful and happy to have had and still enjoy doing this. Um, but I can't pretend that it has been easy. Uh, I started doing um, or building up this collaborative in my third year of my PhD. Um, and I was at the time, and probably still am, extremely naive and idealistic about what it would take to accomplish this mission. Um, so there were so many new things that I had never encountered before, had never thought through before um, for doing research on this scale. Um, and I realized very quickly that, that I didn't know as much as I thought I did uh, what it would be like to work on a team and how to work on a very diverse, large team that spoke different languages and wasn't even able to all convene in the same location. This presented some very unique challenges. Um, and so the learning curve was steep. Um, and I think this was also exacerbated in part that uh, science is often, or at least in psychology, we're trained to do much of the work as individuals. Um, and so becoming an effective team member or an effective team leader isn't something that you get trained on very explicitly. Um, but that's a whole other that's a whole other talk we could get into. Um, I think that developing these leadership strategies, there was definitely the biggest learning curve in learning how to effectively delegate and set goals for the group when many of the people that I was working with were at a much more advanced career stage um, was, uh, was a unique challenge for an early career researcher. Um, in addition to leadership, 
Another thing that I, I think would be important to keep in mind if you're thinking about doing this type of work is the time investment and how to time manage a project on this scale. Um, I could have stopped doing my dissertation work completely and only focused on moving many docs forward, and I don't think I still would have had enough time. Um, and please uh, do not get me wrong, I absolutely love this project and my colleagues, and I think the world of them. Full stop. They're fantastic people. But even with such an awesome group, there are times when it's challenging to connect with people and to motivate everyone to stay involved. Uh, of course, like me, they're all figuring out how to navigate this new team environment, balance their own research with group work, and um, we experience many ebbs and flows in the productivity. Um, one final challenge I will mention is that uh, it seems obvious to me, to me now, but I was not prepared for it, that uh, there's an emotional component to this work. Um, you become extremely invested, and I cared very deeply about the project and how to realize the goals. And I let myself become too invested emotionally. Um, and uh, I think there's there's a, a lot of value in talking to other people who have done this type of work before and get their advice on how to navigate this aspect of it in particular. Um, but uh, it takes a lot of practice to figure out how to make decisions in a detached and efficient way, as well as handle the differences um, of opinion fairly and inclusively. Um, and I think this has been a very important growth area for me. So based on this experience, now that I've said all these wonderful things, um, if you're thinking about being a big team science project leader, I have a few more pros and cons just to think about and evaluate. Um, let's start with the cons, uh, which is there's going to be power imbalances that you need to deal with. Um, these just are part of academia, but you navigate them, you learn from them, and you get advice on how to do it, and you can do it. Um, there are going to be time demands that are above and beyond what's physically or emotionally possible for you, um, so you need to be careful with that. Again, advice and support are the way to navigate those challenges. Um, the administrative workload is absolutely bonkers. Um, you could honestly be a full-time administrator for one of the projects, so I highly recommend getting a project manager for one of these. Um, and then finally, the project time scale. These projects are not short. Even if you're doing online behavioral work, uh, sorry, uh, survey work, this will be longer, but if you're doing global behavioral data collection, it's going to take so much longer than you anticipate. Um, and we're not alone in this. Other many X projects, such as many primates, many babies, many birds, and many fishes are doing um, this work as well. We're all figuring out how to uh, keep ourselves moving forward and making steady progress. But on the other hand, pros, it's time for the pros. You make the most amazing teammates and friends doing this work. Science is so much better when you're doing it with like-minded, dedicated people that you really like working with. Um, it'll give you networking uh, possibilities beyond what you thought would happen. You suddenly have this large professional group of people that you're interacting with and making important connections with. You are given lovely mentoring opportunities. I had a fantastic experience working with many established researchers, um, and uh, it was, a, it was um, truly a supercharged mentorship experience that I would never, never trade away. Um, you build lots of important skills that are related to people management, time management, and project planning. And of course, integrating the cutting edge open science tools into your research so that you can not only benefit um, your individual program, but work more effectively as a team. So after all of that, <laughs> if you're an early career researcher who's thinking about whether or not you would like to lead a big team pro a science project, Here's the advice that I wish I could have heard back in 2018 when this was all getting started. Yes, I think that big team science is worth it. Also, BTS, totally worth it. Um, but seriously, um, be the team leader. The benefits are going to outweigh the efforts 100 times, and you'll make amazing connections and friends. It's going to take so much time, more time than you realize. So build in buffers and just be prepared for that. Also, you can't do this alone. You need to build that leadership team that's going to be the core of the, uh, the initiative and keep you moving forward and keep you supported. And finally, just don't just don't care so much. You can't afford to, and it's not really worth it. Don't don't uh, don't invest that time there. Um, focus on what's really important, which is the collective goal that you're all trying to reach. Um, so I could add more, but I think this is a good place to stop. And I hope I haven't gone over my time. Um, but uh, we're keep we're gonna publish our paper soon. Keep an eye out for that.
and thank you all very much for your attention. Thanks, Julie. That was really stimulating. I'm sure we'll have some discussion at the end. Uh, thanks for those really interesting reflections on the process. Our next speaker is Lena Seidler of the NHMRC Clinical Trials Center at the University of Sydney, where she leads the next gen evidence synthesis team within the evidence integration group. And Lena's work focuses on methods aimed at increasing collaboration and coordination in research to maximize the value of data and reduce research waste. This includes the development and application of next generation evidence synthesis approaches, such as individual participant data and prospective meta analyses. Thanks, Julie. Thank you very much. All right, thanks so much for having me and a really great session to be talking in. So I'm talking about quite similar concepts, um, but from a slightly different angle because I come from the evidence synthesis angle where we think a lot about leveraging or bringing together what's already there, um, but actually translating into quite similar projects um, into big team science working together. Um, can you just figure out how to work this? Oh yeah, it's clicked. Um, that wasn't so hard. Um, and these are my findings and um, conflicts of interest. And I just thought before I start talking about um, the example I'm walking you through today, I just wanted to introduce um, the terminology, the concept that I'm working with. Um, the first one is individual participant data meta analysis, which is all about identifying and bringing together all studies in a field on a certain research question and getting their raw row by row data. Um, so instead of doing an aggregate data meta analysis where we bring together primary estimates from papers, we uh, identify the papers and then try to get their data. Um, and the second concept um, is prospective meta analysis. Often these two are combined, um, where we try to identify trials um, whilst they're planned or ongoing, so very early on in the process, um, which is quite big in hot topics such as COVID, where lots of research is happening on one question, we try to bring them together and try to get them to harmonize the outcomes, which can reduce um, phenomena such as publication bias and also just lead to more power, more evidence, um, easier brought together. Now, the second thing I wanted to do before I jump into the big team science is talk about the example and why we think it's important um, and should be addressed in this kind of question. Um, so this collaboration I'm talking about today is on child obesity, which is a major problem. So in Australia alone, um, you have one of four children that enter school overweight or with obesity. And um, this leads to trajectory of cognitive health problems, um, cardiovascular health. We see diabetes happening really early on in adolescence. Um, and it's also a major health equity issue. So um, you have priority populations that struggle with it a lot harder that are really hard to reach. However, early intervention is extremely complex because we live in a really obesogenic environment. Now, previously, what we've done is we've done such an individual participant perspective meta analysis where we brought together four trials. And we learned that early intervention can be effective. However, we also learned that different that an early prevention intervention is not the same, or different interventions are very different from each other. Um, you can prevent obesity in many different ways. And some seem to be more effective than others. So we decided this problem needs to be addressed a lot larger scale. And we planned the top trial collaboration, which aims to bring together all completed planned ongoing trials in this field. And what we wanted to do, um, you can see here with a deep load, is we wanted to take all those colorful interventions out there and understand them, sort them into their components, um, and then be able to look at different populations as well. So kind of realign them for different groups to say which interventions could work for whom. Um, so a little bit more scientifically here on this slide. So we wanted to form and grow the top track collaboration by identifying all trials in this space, both planned, ongoing, and completed. Then our project one was to do such an individual participant data meta-analysis um, to look at effectiveness also for different groups. Different, the second project was all about 
understanding and prevention using different pre-existing taxonomies such as behavior change taxonomies and adaptation to Tidia. And the third project will be to bring that all together. And this is what our collaboration looks like at the moment. So we have 57 trials um, and um, with almost 40,000 participants and they are growing. Now, um, but um, particularly in regards to the first presentation today, I'd just briefly talk about generalizability. So yes, we have a truly international collaboration, which is great. Um, however, I, higher income countries are overrepresented and child obesity is increasingly a major problem also in lower and middle income countries, and maybe addressed really differently. And this is something we see across our different collaborations. Um, also for other questions, we see more higher income countries but then even if we see lower and middle income countries doing trials, they often only happen in um, highly specialized settings. So to give you an example from another study we're doing, we were really excited to have all these lower and middle income countries contributing trials because the intervention would be one that's really cheap to implement. And then we looked further and realized that all happen in highly specialized hospitals that are not really um, representative of um, the settings that we're actually interested in. So something to think about and work on and think in this space. Now with Top Child, um, we thought um, we have experienced this area. Um, it's gonna be a beautiful stroll down the mountain once we get our funding. Um, needless to say, it doesn't look quite like that. Um, there are lots of hurdles we have to get over. And I will talk you through a few of these. I think it may tie in with some of the lessons and um, previous speakers have referred to as well. So from how do we identify the studies from the beginning to how do we build a collaboration, get people to contribute their data, and then how do we manage and process all these different data sets, bring them together, which analysis do we choose, and how do we implement this, which I think is particularly relevant in health sciences because we really try to solve a health problem. So we want to make sure the research question we address and the research we do then um, gets implemented into practice. All right. So the first step for this is, oops, it's not no longer working, hold on. Um, all right, here we go. Um, so the first lesson of identifying unpublished studies is crucial. We're trying to reduce selected outcome reporting publication bias. So um, we want, to, and we want to identify planned and ongoing studies to include in our collaboration. How do we do this? And health research, particularly when looking at clinical trials, has a massive advantage here because we have really high registration rates. So, um, and these resources can be used not just to um, make sure our hypotheses are tested as we um, state them to be tested, but to identify these trials very early on. So we developed some guidance here, but I'd be quite interested to see how other fields can use their records as well to make them searchable and um, build these collaborations because that way we can leverage studies and funding that's already there rather than having to bring these funding together. And to give you the example of Top Child, um, we have 20% of studies that we identified by registry searches only. Um, and that is a mix between studies that weren't published yet, but also studies that may have never published um, that we were able to convince to share their data with us. Now the second lesson I think also ties well into what we had previously. These projects um, are quite different to what I'm used to as a system of review because suddenly I'm mainly dealing with people, not with paper. And that can be really positive, but it also brings um, a lot of challenges. So um, building collaboration takes time and energy, as mentioned by my previous speaker. And we actually tracked our time spent on Top Child and 450 hours alone in one year was spent on communication tasks. So recruiting trials, um, telling them to share their data um, and so on. And talking a little bit more about recruitment, um, one main lesson we learned is really to use different modes. We start via email, but we all know as researchers, we get endless emails. So then we try to meet them. We try to track them down at conferences. And um, now there are actually some face-to-face -face conferences again. We call people. And one key strategy is really to get um, what we call research superstars that are really well known in the field into the collaboration and enthusiastic early on and get them to establish the communication. And yeah, generally I think bringing together people front, across continents, cultures, languages, time zones requires a lot of um, social skills and sensitivity 
Um, and luckily, I have some really great team members that are very good communicators at that. Um, then data sharing. Um, not an easy process. And sometimes you get people that are very enthusiastic to collaborate at first, and then they realize they actually want their data, and suddenly they fall silent. Um, so you've seen um, this slide um, in Aiden's talk um, on the first day. Um, we've done some research on this, looking at um, what is the support to data sharing in theory, and then what does it look like in practice. So while a lot of researchers um, support the concept in theory and say data sharing is a great thing, um, only about 40% say, oh yeah, I'd share my data. And then if you look at registration records where it's now mandatory to state whether you will share your data, only 20% commit to it. Um, and I think it's really important to drive the point home here that it is insufficient to blame the individual researcher. This is quite a busy slide and you can find um, our analysis of what the different stakeholders should do in the paper. But what I just wanted to say here is it is a structural, cultural and financial problem that lots of stakeholders play a role in so, and requires a lot of changes, systemic changes, um, rather than just getting angry at the researcher. Now, in the meantime, before we um, revolutionize the research system, um, how do we deal with this for our, um, for our collaborative projects? So the, I think it's really important to remember how um, challenging academia is and to make this easy for researchers. So what we try to do is we try to reward collaborators for their interest until that uh, authorship becomes a thing. We are very generous with authorship. We invite collaborators to all our uh, papers. We try to um, generate a lot of opportunities to connect and forge new collaborations and gain academic credit. Um, but the other thing we do is remind of the potential impact of the collaboration. So um, we can, particularly for problems such as child obesity, we remind researchers that we can only focus major health problems together and that they can have a really positive impact, that um, this impact will translate into high impact publications. We have a bit of a portfolio of previous um, high impact publications that we kind of were able to lead to with these projects to try to um, convince them. And um, we also highlight how closely we work with guideline developers and policymakers. Again, to say, if you work with us, you will have this great impact on the health research field. Um, now, sometimes that doesn't work. Then I come with a stick. Um, <laughs> and um, we do name researchers that don't share the data in our publications, and we warn them of that. Um, we also try to contact their journals, ethics committees, and institutions to say, why is this researcher not sharing their data? with us um, to advance things. Now data sharing um, then wants the collaborator to say, yay, we want to share our data, and we say, great, we'll receive it. Should be easy, it's not. Um, we are experiencing major delays in the process of data sharing, and that's something that's getting worse and worse. So um, with Top Child, um, after over a year, we had still 11 requests outstanding of people that said, I want to share my data, and we said, yeah, we want to get it. Um, so we really need to streamline data sharing standards and infrastructure. Um, because otherwise, I think we may have bureaucracy um, in the way of that entire commitment. Now we've received the data. Again, um, a lot of complexity. Um, so for Top Child, we had over 50 large and complex data sets to make, be merged into one that won't necessarily be generated to be put together. Maybe that's one of the differences to um, some of my previous collaborators. So this takes time, it's error prone. Data harmonization can be extremely tricky, tricky and data comes from many different formats and languages. So for example, we received one data set in Hebrew um, and diff 40 different Excel sheets from right to left and had to somehow Google Translate our way into understanding the data. It's extremely challenging. So how do we make sure this process isn't too error prone? We've um, developed quite a complex step-by-step um, -step approach, which I'm not going to talk you through right now because I don't want to send you to sleep, but I am happy to share with anyone um, who's interested in doing similar projects. The main lessons we have here is we need standard processes, need duplication. In systematic reviews and meta-analysis, everything is done by at least two people. And we try to do the same in our individual system data analysis. 
So each data set is processed by at least two people and trained by at least two people. And often we actually consult additional team members because things get very complex. We always have um, a consistency between our two coders. It's really sorry, so it is necessary to do this. Um, it needs to be replicable and well documented. Um, and we need a, a very regular communication stream with our investigators. Another lesson is to use as much automation early on as possible. There are a lot of data sets. We try to have standardized automated cleaning scripts that can then be slightly adapted to each trial rather than reinventing the wheel every time. Um, luckily, so this is Kylie Hunter, who's presenting later, um, is developing more standard ways of doing this. Um, just wanted to flag that here to you so you can all work out for it. Now, um, some outcomes are really difficult or impossible to harmonize retrospectively. So we bring studies together and then measure the outcomes in completely different ways. And um, we get around this by trying to find as many studies early on before they're completed as possible and go through standard harmonization processes. And again, there'll be a talk by James this afternoon on this, so I don't have to talk much more. Um, and the other thing we try to do within our field, and we're actually working with top class researchers on this, is to um, establish core outcome sets. So to ask researchers, what should any researcher working in this field measure? And actually in future, we'll talk about how exactly should they measure this. And using these big collaborations to decide on this together, we're hoping that then they, they who are the leading researchers in their field will actually also use these. So we'll have a much easier job in future. Um, let me briefly talk about analysis um, and the possibilities. Um, and I think again, we need to be really careful here to not over, um, to not use too many of those, or at least if we do so, um, process it as exploratory. So we need to be really aware of data dredging. Um, proof of specification is essential. And one thing we do is we actually get our collaborators to call out our protocol, stating exactly what we're going to do. So we then don't have them come back and say, oh, but what if we analyze this slightly differently? That's something we've experienced a lot in previous collaborations. And that they wanted to judge the data because they had certain beliefs. Integrity, a major issue in this field. And this is actually something, again, um, Kylie will talk about later, luckily, so I, so I could talk about this for hours. But um, we do have standard integrity checks, and we do exclude quite a few studies, particularly once we see the individual participant data for integrity reasons. So it's a major problem, and it's important for anyone in the field. And a big argument for individual participant data because many of these studies look absolutely fine when we look at their publication. And the last lesson I want to drive home is that um, it's important to think about implementation from the start. Um, what we did for Top Child is we mapped our stakeholders, who do we want to reach with um, the answers to our research questions very early on. We actually got them to co-design our research questions and um, our protocol. We invite consumers and relevant stakeholders into our advisory groups, and we budget for translation and implementation. And I think one key learning here is to really leverage the collaborative network, because we have so many experts um, across different countries, and we're using those to then get our findings um, into these different countries as well, to make sure we actually have a health impact. So in summary, um, big team science does not fit our traditional academic rewards and publishing system. Um, so I think it's important to work together to make it fit and be quite generous here to people that um, donate their time to these projects. Um, it requires a lot of people management and communication, um, but I think it's important to really also emphasize the positives of this large network, which can lead to new connections and impact. It demands a lot of rigor and team specification, and um, watch the space or get in touch for our methods on data processing and integrity because we put a lot of work into trying to get this right. And then it can reduce bias, improve statistical power, and allow additional analysis for relatively little funding. Our IPDs are so much cheaper than any of those in Google trials, and we can answer so many more questions with so much more certainty. So I think it's really um, important to drive that time how much additional um, profit we can generate here. And it allows direct pathways to implementation and impact. So it's important to plan ahead and leverage these. Now, one last lesson um, is the power of collaboration. I think my other, the other speakers have already brought out as well. So together we can answer questions that no single trial or simple meta-analysis would be able to address. 
and that's really powerful. And this is um, one of the Zoom meetings we had with the Top Talk collaboration. Um, to acknowledge the Top Talk steering group. So these are all people that work very closely with Top Talk. Um, and I want to acknowledge my team, the next gen evidence synthesis team, that are brilliant at dumping all the hurdles I showed you in the beginning. Um, and without whom none of this would be possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lane. Really impressive project. So our final speaker in the session is Lauren Wool, who's a postdoctoral fellow in computational neuroscience at UCL, University College London, where she studies the large-scale population activity of motor neurons in the behaving mouse brain. She is fluent in big data analysis, interdisciplinary team dynamics, and open science principles, and how they combine to generate high impact resources for the scientific community. She studies knowledge transfer inside the International Brain Laboratory, an open science collaboration of more than 100 neuroscientists worldwide. And we can see your slide. Thanks to Beth. Uh, Lauren, can we? Can you hear me? I can hear you speaking as well. Yes. Great. Good. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties earlier, and thank you all for helping me out. Um, Right, so uh, my name is Lauren. Thanks, Alex, for the introduction. Um, today, I want to discuss with you open neuroscience in the IBL, the International Brain Laboratory. Um, I'm a postdoc at UCL in London and have been part of IBL since its inception in 2017. So we study systems neuroscience, and for those unfamiliar with that, it's the study of the brain and how the activity of neurons in the brain are related to the activities and behaviors that we observe in the organism. So it studies everything from sensory functions like vision and audition to motor behavior, navigation, learning and memory, or in our group's case, decision making or how we decide to act in the world. And a lot of this work involves training animals like mice to perform behavioral tasks, and we use a lot of techniques to record the activity of the brain during this behavior. So it's a really broad field with a lot of moving parts. Um, and because it's so broad, there are some big challenges for how the field works to generate insight into brain function. The first is limited data and throughput. It takes a really long time to train animals, refine the recording techniques, and traditionally, as people have already said this today, it's usually a single postdoc or grad student doing all of this work. Um, the second issue that comes up is limited reproducibility because there are so many different species, tasks, protocols, or methods, and hypotheses even to test um, being used across different labs. It really makes reproducibility quite difficult. Um, and the last thing is limited data sharing. Um, data typically live locally in a single lab. Um, and because we're all asking slightly different questions, it really limits how useful it is to share data. So it sort of remains siloed in physical locations. Um, so with these challenges, it's evident that, the, um, that they are in part technological or methodological having to do with um, how we deploy the science or the methods available to us. But there's also a cultural component um, and a sociological basis to some of this. Um, and that's driven by the traditional lab structure and how scientists are sort of used to practicing um, their science. So to overcome this, the International Brain Laboratory was an experiment set up in 2017 to see if some of these challenges could be overcome by designing a new way to practice systems neuroscience. Who are we? Um, we are a large distributed collaboration of neuroscientists who study decision making and the brain. Um, we're over five countries, 16 institutions. I think currently we're 22 labs. And we're a network of over 100 researchers that includes faculty, postdocs, graduate students, master students, technicians, staff, um, some software developers, rotating students, um, and probably some other smaller groups that I'm even failing to mention. So we're quite a diverse group. But what makes us unique and unified is our approach, which is one species, one behavior, one apparatus. And what I mean by this is that we decide to use one single um, animal species for the study, which is a mouse model. Um, and the reason we use a mouse model for studying brain and behavior is because the mouse brain strikes a really good balance between biological complexity, but also tractability. So that's one decision we made. Um, one behavior means we designed a single behavioral task for mice to perform no matter where they are, um, which lab they're in. And one apparatus means we create a single rig for collecting this behavioral and neural data um, based on our task. So our goals with this collaboration kind of occupy two spaces. We've got our scientific goal, which is to understand the neural circuits and computations that support decision making across the entire brain. And for this, we're going to need really big data sets because even the mouse brain is a big place. And if we need big data, we're going to have to distribute this data collection somehow because, as I said before, it's well beyond what a single person or lab can do. 
And so because of this last bit, we also have a sociological goal. We want to demonstrate that neuroscience can be done in this distributed manner. So the large group can pull efforts and work collaboratively. Um, and we also want to share data and infrastructure that we create, um, not only within the collaboration, but also with the greater scientific community. So the scientific goal is a technical one, having much to do with standardization, unifying our practices and protocols so we know that distributed data collection can be recombined later on in our analysis. So this involves standardizing behavior, how we train the mice and how they perform the behavior, uh, standardizing electrophysiology, so the probed um, methods we use to record brains um, during the behavior, and also standardizing the data architecture, how we format, archive, and share the various types of data that we collect. Um, the sociological goal is a cultural one. How do we govern ourselves to support the scientific goal? That involves how we organize the people in the collaboration, how we make decisions to guide our progress, and how we keep track of this progress over time. So our first scientific milestone was standardizing the behavior, the apparatus and the tasks that the mice perform. Um, I already said that we started in 2017 and you'll note that the platform paper was released in 2021. So it took a really long time um, to get this over the finish line. It required researchers to teach each other about everything from animal behavior to surgeries, to training, um, data collection strategies, building and deploying a custom rig that could be built anywhere. Um, and I'm not even going to mention like the, the numerous iterations of problem solving that we had to do. Um, it's all in the past now, so I can quickly just mention it without having to get into details. Um, but at the end of this process, our main result was that we have one standard behavioral paradigm for mice, and the data coming out of each lab was indistinguishable from another lab. So we were fairly confident that we could pool all these data for subsequent analyses. Um, the method is that we, we provided all the protocols for training the mice, doing the surgeries, or building the apparatus, so anyone in the world could start collecting data as well. And lastly, we provided all the data. So I think currently now the data set um, is over 1,000 mice and over 30,000 sessions. Um, and just as a comparison, I had an individual project sort of ticking along in the background on this. It has six mice and 60 sessions over the probably about the same amount of time. So we really, really have nailed the throughput here. We've got a really large scale data set with an open source method that anyone can use. Um, this is one of my favorite images from 2019 as we were trying to get the lab set up. Um, this was right after we designed the, the behavioral rig for the mice and sent it off to each lab as a, as a kit, like a build your own kit, um, all built independently, all in different places. And the photos from each lab really show a win for standardization here. You can see that um, you know, we provided all the instructions and all the tools and it was sort of like grown up science Lego and it worked really, really well. So that was a win for us there. Um, once we were able to achieve standardization outside the brain um, with the behavior, we needed to achieve it inside the brain with our recording techniques. So I won't go into too much detail here, um, but suffice to say that combining EFIS data across labs in neuroscience is basically unheard of. It's really, really difficult to do. Um, but this paper, which we recently posted in BioArchive, describes how we identified the conditions under which it could be possible. So the first thing is experimental design. It really helps to have a standard task, which I just described. Um, in terms of methods, we developed a centralized pipeline to histologically reconstruct exactly where we record in every single brain. So every single brain in our um, research program goes through one lab that does the histology. And then finally, we developed a data quality control pipeline. So data were inspected and assessed based on a predetermined threshold, and the threshold was developed as a collaboration-wide policy. And I'll get into policy stuff um, in, a, in just a second. So finally, our scientific aims would not be possible without a large-scale data architecture for sharing and combining data across all these labs. Um, basically, this, this um, slide to me just show, is meant to show you that it's complicated. Um, so I won't, again, go into details. Don't worry, you will not be quizzed. Um, it's complicated and required stitching together a lot of sort of off-the-shelf parts um, for each step to create a seamless process from data collection all the way to data visualization and sharing. Um, for details, we have a bioarchive paper and all the code is available on our website too if you wanted to implement it for yourself. Um, but this was an enormous effort to build this infrastructure and it was um, critically mostly completed through the efforts of dedicated software devs. Um, so this is really beyond the scope of knowledge for nearly all of the academics in the collaboration. So we really had to challenge ourselves um, and expand our notion of what a scientist looked like because we had a bunch of people working on this part of the project that was critical for our success, but had really never stepped foot in any neuroscience lab before. Um, so all of these developments underpin our most recent major milestone, which is a brain-wide map of decision-making. 
we can now explore multiple different brain areas of the mouse and see how neurons in those regions behave during this one single standardized behavioral task. The data set was generated by researchers recording from various parts of the brain, all distributed across different labs, and all wild mice performed the behavior. And then we combine all of this EFIS data into a single map. So you can see on the left here, all the recording sites made by a particular lab. So each one of these lines is a, is a probe track um, that records from single neurons. And in total, the data set currently includes 115 animals, 12 different labs, covering 194 different brain regions and is about 30,000 neurons. So a data set like this is really unique in neuroscience. And now it's data set that everyone can access, whether they are part of IBL or not. Um, if you want to visit it, it's biz.internationalbrainlab.org. So how is all this possible? Of course, as with all science, it relies on people, and we have quite a diversity of roles in the IBL. And all of these roles have to speak to each other in order to get anything done. So much of our organizational governance is concerned with um, knowledge sharing across different, different domains. So I mentioned that IBL is distributed across countries and time zones. So the first obvious part of this governance was creating a central hub. And for us, this was a virtual hub. Um, we use Google Workspace, which is where we document our decision-making processes, Zoom, as we're all familiar with, to discuss and delegate stuff face-to-face. -face. Um, and we use Slack for real-time communication and troubleshooting. It's much more real-time. We can refine quite quickly. And we use GitHub for sharing all of our code, collaborating on software, and registering our scientific projects. Atop this virtual hub, the people structure of IBL is built to encourage engagement. It's the flattened hierarchy where everyone has access to all information and decision processes can be accessed by all these different communities. So the structure is based around working groups, which are these, um, get my pointer up on screen so I can point it out. Um, each of these working groups specialize in a certain scientific activity and they contain a mix of faculty, researchers and staff. And these are open and permeable. Anyone can join or leave and rejoin. Um, there's no membership requirement here. Each working group is chaired by a faculty member who reports to an executive board here. Um, and it's also co-chaired by a, a researcher who is usually an early career researcher or a staff member or a software developer who reports to their own group of associate chairs. And these two bodies allow knowledge to flow between the working groups. So everyone is kind of aware of what everyone else is working on at any given time. The General Assembly is a decision-making body um, comprising all of the faculty and the researchers and ECRs elect two representatives to make sure their interests are being represented there as well. So there are multiple avenues and opportunities to engage with policies or decision-making processes. Um, you might hear about something through your working group or as part of the associate chairs group or part of the executive board, but information is meant to travel freely across all of these areas. So it's not uncommon to hear about something um, one or two or even three different ways. So we have a formal decision-making process in IBL um, to support this infrastructure. Um, part of this flattened hierarchy is the principle that ideas can come from anyone. Ideas can be related to the science that we're doing, for example, to propose a new technique or change a protocol, or it can be related to the organization, organization itself, um, like a proposed change to how we think meetings should be run or how our representatives should be elected, how often we should meet or where we should meet for the annual meeting. These ideas are developed into full-fledged proposals by those who know the most about the work. This is typically a working group or some specific set of, of stakeholders. So once we have a draft of the policy, we can start talking about it through discussions on Slack or direct comments on the text in the Google Doc or over Zoom meetings. And this policy will be refined in response to that discussion. And when the working group thinks it's ready, it will be sent to the General um, Assembly for consent. So it's not just a vote. Um, this, um, we're asking folks to tell us whether the proposed course of action is good enough for now, safe enough to try. And this is a sociocratic principle that we've adopted and it keeps us very nimble. Um, we're not asking the General Assembly to vote on whether this is the perfect answer um, for the question at hand. We're looking for something that works right now. Um, and it's really nice to have this codified because um, again, it keeps, us, it keeps us nimble. We can work quickly through problems and we can always revisit later if we find that what we've tried for now um, doesn't fit for whatever reason later on. And this is an iterative process. So if there are objections um, or concerns, we learn through that experience, we figure out what works for everybody, and when it doesn't, we start this process over again. So the last part of our governance that I want to discuss is our organizational memory, and there are two parts to this. Um, the first I just mentioned with our decision-making process is writing policies. 
For the average academic, it is super boring and very, very far away from neuroscience, but the policies are absolutely critical for making the collaboration run. We write a lot of policies and it's not always smooth sailing. It's sometimes, everyone uses this expression, it feels like we're building the plane while we fly it. Um, it it's fine, we can overcome it. it Having this iterative process helps alleviate some of these tensions that arise um, when, say, personal or um, individual lab priorities and organizational collaborative priorities don't quite align. And our policies allow us to set expectations in advance about how we work together, and that lets us build trust and confidence in the organization. And that lets us build trust and confidence in the organization, but also outside. Um, so these policies are all public facing on GitHub if anyone's interested in, in visiting them. And again, we, we have a commitment to our greater scientific community with the resources that we're um, developing and deploying. So we wanna make sure that our organizational structure is also available um, for inspection as well. And because we have such a robust decision-making process, we can refine these policies as we carry on to reflect our changing needs and priorities. And this really reflects the fact that we are living collaboration. The collaboration is much different um, now in 2022 than it was in 2017. Um, and that's quite exciting. It makes things quite difficult. Um, but again, keeping track by way of policy writing kind of lets us see how we're growing and, and what challenges we need to meet. So the second critical part of our organizational memory has to do with keeping track of the science that we all produce. Um, so as academics yourselves, I don't need to tell you about the publish or perish landscape. You're well aware of it. Systems neuroscience is no different. If you want to progress, you need to prove that you've been doing impactful science. But because these IVL projects are so long and have so many people involved, it's incredibly easy to forget what contributions people are making. And this is especially true of efforts that aren't visible in the final paper PDF, um, but that we're still stepping stones to the end result. So we want to track all these dead ends and pivots and redos and oopsie daisies because they all inform the final product, first of all. And second of all, um, people spent time working on them. And that's part of science is that you're going to bark up trees that you know don't produce. But it's sort of the least we can do in our collaboration to make sure that people are recognized for those efforts. And tracking these, con these contributions in real time lets us see how the project has changed and who has helped. So importantly, we found that a lot of scientific activities differ in a big collaboration compared to a smaller lab, but we can, we found for the most part, we can mostly standardize the way we describe these activities using frameworks like the credit taxonomy, um, which I, for people who aren't aware, I'm sure most of you are, um, things like who conceptualized the work, who wrote it, the resources, that sort of thing. It's not perfect. And we have been considering ways to add to the framework to capture more types of organizational labor that are required to keep groups on track, who takes notes to the meetings, who manages the meeting calendar, who's providing support and outreach to people trying to use the data, who's teaching courses to undergrads, um, using their data sets. So here, what I'm showing on screen is an example um, of a, what we call a contribution matrix that visualizes the efforts of each author here on the top um, of the behavioral paper that I showed that we published in 2021. Um, and you can see the activities are quite wide ranging, but you can easily get a sense of who was responsible for which part of the project and the strengths um, in which they um, contributed to these. So critically, we're able to include this as a main figure in our paper. Um, so there were definitely people at eLife where we published um, who were willing to sort of see this taxonomy and credit tracking succeed. So that at least gives us a little bit of promise that um, the greater community and at least um, some people in publishing are, are sort of open-minded to big collaborations and what their outputs might look like. So I'm gonna end there in the interest of time, but I'd like to thank everyone who makes this work possible with a special thanks to our funders who've given us the resources to run this enormous experiment. And thank you so much for listening and I really look forward to answering any questions you guys might have. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Fascinating governance uh, structure. And I'm sure um, there'll be various questions or discussion points about your talk or one of the earlier ones. So open up to the floor here. And, and, and I should say, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, you can, I'll either try to repeat your question or for anyone who's willing to yell, um, you can try that as well. Yeah, please, please. Hey, I'm Elliot. Um, I'm also working on a, a big team science project called the Mini Eco Evo Analyst Study. 
um, a common theme across the talk was, um, you know, issues of unexpected challenges and timeline rollouts and, you know, just the enormous challenges of dealing with processes of collecting the data and, you know, just, I guess, yeah, wrangling teams and wrangling the data as well. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about the breadth of experiences because, you know, um, I think, Julia, you spoke of those challenges in particular, whereas, um, yeah, in the last talk, it seemed like, you know, you've got this giant governance structure. Is it just that, you know, these challenges um, are inherent to these complex um, projects, or is it just because, you know, the, these are new styles of uh, collaborating scientifically and we're just trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to do them? So uh, that's a question for anyone who wants to answer. Lena. I, I can um, jump in first and then anyone else can add. I think it's a mix. I think large collaborations will always take a lot of chances in management and robust discussions. But there are certainly processes we can establish um, that can make this easier. And I think there are two um, dimensions to this. There's the dimension of the system we're operating in. And currently, the academic system is not really made for these large collaborations. So I think um, giving more academic credits for participating, content such as data authorship, where um, contributing your data um, counts in your track record, can really help to make this easier on a systems level. Even some journals don't allow that many authors at the moment. And then there's the internal processes where I think a lot can be established. And for example, we now have um, a custom built collaboration management software where we have for each collaborator detailed contact logs, where we have kind of profiles for everyone. Um, and we have a lot of internal processes of how we deal with our collaboration that's made subsequent collaborations way easier to manage, um, which I'd also be very happy to share with anyone. Um, and we're actually also writing on a paper, working on a paper kind of trying to summarize the main um, systems we're using there for others that do the same. So yeah, I think it's, it's both. It's a system we're operating in where so much could happen, but it's, oh, there are also strategies within our team and, and sufficient funding. I think a lot of people still don't understand how much people's time is required for these. And that's partly why we run projects such as tracking our time and hoping to publish that to then be able to say we're budgeting for all this um, people manage people's time because that's what we need to run this kind of collaboration well. I'm sure others have um, comments to add. I think that was a perfect response, um, but I guess because this is a collaborative effort, I should add something. Um, I, th I think one of the challenges, at least in IBL, that we face is because everything is operating parallel. So I only spoke about the collaboration as if this is everything that everyone in the collaboration thinks about all the time, but that's just not true. Everyone has their own lab with their own people who are either in the collaboration or not. Um, and it takes a really, a really large amount of effort to convince people to to pay into it occasionally, depending on who you are. I think there's like a core of people who are really invested in the scientific question and the sociological question experiment. And there are other people who are like, yeah, I mean, I think this is all great and everything. And I'd love to be involved, but like, do I have to write policy? Do I have to go to these meetings? And so you're always constantly encountering that. And, it's a huge amount of time spent as well. So I, I acknowledge that people only have like, you know, I could say eight hours, but I know academics spend more than eight hours a day. Um, so it's basically borrowing from one, one set of structures that you're doing on a daily basis and, and giving them to another set of structures um, for a, a new experiment that's like not really well mapped, I think. So it's a risk for a lot of people. A question uh, from Rana. I, I, was, I found the um, Lauren in the last um, uh, presentation, I uh, thought it was interesting what you said about the credit economy, and I, I'm sure that in, uh, that in the other projects this is an, a thing too. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in credit and, and these sort of ways of, of uh, distributing 
uh, you know, credits in, in projects like this. And I'm just curious for all of you, like, what is your, what are your experiences with it? Like, what, like, say, if you could change the credits of Formu, what would you change, both in small ways, like adding categories, or in big ways, like you're saying, it's like not a good uh, structure. So I, I love the credit taxonomy. I really like the idea of it. Um, I will say that we've we've done a little bit of meta science work on it in the PSA, and 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 one of the challenges we're finding is that um, describing describing what you did on a project is not a totally reliable process. And so if we take written descriptions of what somebody did on a project, and then have three or four separate people fill out the credit taxonomy on behalf of that offer author, we, we find that they click different boxes. Um, and that's not even taken into consideration the distinction between minor versus major contributions, which is something that Lauren had in her slide. So I think that one of the, the next things, next promising areas of work with credit is to, to leverage some of the tools and expertise that we have in psychology and psychometrics to try to improve the tool. Because when you do a deep dive into the sources of unreliability, you do see patterns, you do see that there are categories in particular that people are confused about um, and categories that tend to co-vary. So maybe are representative um, of a you know standard set of tasks that people encounter. So that's one thing that I think could happen in the future of credit. And then obviously they're also working very hard to expand the taxonomy right now and, and to try to make it more applicable to other disciplines. I think that it works pretty well in psychology personally, but I, I understand that some people in other disciplines feel like they've been filling some pretty important roles that don't neatly fit into one of their categories. So I think like a lot of really interesting meta scientific advancements, um, we've now proposed a really interesting tool and it's now time to evaluate that tool, not to try to tear it down, but to try to find ways of improving it. I mean, I generally, I think credit is great, but I have a problem for this project with authorship in general and how we have to bend um, definitions of authorship to make them fit to give credit to people that donate a lot of their data, but also a lot of their time to help us figure out these data. So what we now have, we require people to at least contribute their data, answer the queries, help us shape this into the format, but then also review critically the final paper which means our papers have um, 100 people thinking they have to contribute some kind of comment to it, which is such a long process and does not always improve the paper. Um, it does to a certain extent. So we have a massive problem with peer review as well, because we often don't find anyone um, who can peer review the paper because everyone um, who's an expert in the field is part of the collaboration and has conflict of interest. So we've spent over a year trying to find peer reviewers for top childs for the protocols, and then had hardly any comments because the 100 experts had already um, looked at it. So um, I think authorship is a concept that doesn't always work, at least for us, very well. And we try to bend it to make it fit. So I don't know if that's credit or whether that's just broader. How do we how do we give credit in academia? <laughs> to briefly add to that point as well, I, I think that it's something that journals are very aware of, and I've had a lot of conversations with with Nature Publishing and PNAS and and plus on on you know on, on on these things and one of the things that doesn't help is that there really isn't agreed upon definition of what authorship means um, and and those are just explicit definitions there's certainly no agreement in our implicit beliefs of what authorship means and so so part of that is sort of you know necessary reform and I, I think that a lot of journals are interested um, in expanding their definitions and, and many journals don't require contribution to a manuscript as you know a requirement for authorship anymore. I see JME, which is a very you know impactful set of publication criteria. They do require that you contribute to writing, uh, but I think other journals are starting to see that that might not be necessary and could be entirely counterproductive when you have hundreds of co-authors. But uh, I think that we could have an entire panel on authorship challenges in big team science. In fact, uh, we, we we had an ad hoc panel on that about eight months ago, um, and, and uh, but there was many many unanswered questions. So I think that's also an area where there's just a, a lot of need for discussion and a lot of need for meta science research and trying new policies and refining those policies. New journal for big team science. So that's your next uh, task, Nicholas. <laughs> that sounds fun. I'm into it. Um, maybe we'll, uh, we got one last qu real quick question. 
Great question. Um, I mean, we have this. Do you mind repeating it? Sorry, I couldn't quite. I couldn't quite catch it. Sorry. Um. Oh, so the question was: When you find and exclude papers with integrity problems, what do you do next? Um. And that is a really interesting question because something we are actually currently trying to make decisions on because there are there are people that we've invited to be collaborators that we work together with that have shared the data and then um. I think it could be very bad for our reputation for future collaboration to then say, oh, then we go away and um, get really angry and tell the journalists to retract. On the other hand, we also don't want bad papers out there. So I think what we're currently considering is some kind of um, process. So there are papers that we exclude where we're not fully sure um, how much is wrong with them. We think it may just have been slightly badly designed or we're kind of on the edge and we feel we have such a great collection of high quality data sets, we don't want them in there, but we don't think, we, we're not sure whether it really is an integrity problem. So those we possibly won't do much about. There are some with really major red flags and those we are leaning towards contacting the journal um, and asking for retractions. But yeah, it's a really difficult process we got, because we don't want to jeopardize our ability to um, encourage people to collaborate with us in the future but we also don't want, um, and yeah, do we even list them in our publications? Do we maintain them? Haven't fully decided, but that's something we're actually currently working on. And recommendations would be very welcome. And just as a follow-up on the previous comment, I should say that Amos is starting a um, journal platform for meta research, and so there are a lot of big team science issues, I think, would, would fall in scope. One more thing, 2.30 today, Kylie will give a whole presentation on this. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, thank all our speakers and a great discussion as well. Thank you.